Welcome to TCC family. We pray today's service inspires you to walk closer to Jesus. Whether you're watching from YouTube or Facebook, we encourage you to subscribe and follow our pages to stay connected. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to hit the notification bell. We're glad you're here. I'm going to speak to you a word. I got a word from the Lord for you. It's called Jesus in the house. Say with me, Jesus in the house. Say it again, Jesus in the house. And I'm going to read to you the book of Mark chapter 2. We put the scriptures up. Ah, there we are. I can't, okay. It says, a few days later, when Jesus ent again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. Say with me, the people heard that he had come home. Say one more time. The people heard that he had come home. I'm going to keep on reading. They gather in such a large number that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them, and he preached the word to them. So the setting was Capernaum. It was a small fishing village located to the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. This is the place where Peter had his house. It was thought that Jesus used to stay at this house whenever he, uh, he came by, by this city. Now, this city was also the chief commercial and social center for that region. This was also the site of a Roman garrison whose job was to, to establish the laws of Rome, but also to collect taxes from the locals. Jesus used to teach at the local synagogue in this city. This was also the place where he healed Peter, Peter's mother-in-law. Now, that this time, the scripture says that the people heard that Jesus came home. Say with me, the people heard that Jesus had come home. Now... He was in this, in this house again. It's interesting to know that in those days they did not have mass media communications. The way the news traveled was by word of mouth. Say, say with me, word of mouth. Amen. So uh, this word of mouth could travel a person on camel, on a horse, or even a pedestrian. Even with this apparent primitive system, the news about Jesus being in the house traveled extremely fast. By the way, the church has become the church has, has become used to to and and dependent on social media outlets to communicate and to spread the message. It's also used as a means of interpersonal communication. But let us not forget that the systems that we depend on can be manipulated even, and even used to silence us. What I'm talking about is the cancellation of people and even institutions that do not fit the narrative of the prevailing cancel culture. Now, I know it's quiet in this house, but I'm going to say there is a call in the spirit of the Lord that we must not be dependent on media and on systems and on things that can be manipulated and that could be altered because if you grow dependent on them, they can cut you off anytime they want. But there is a primitive, so-called primitive system that has been in existence. See, when God, when the, when God created the heavens and the God spoke, it was the, say with me, the word of mouth. The word of mouth has been, is, and will always be the prevalent means of communication of heaven. God has given you a mouth. He's given you vocal cords. He's given you a, a, a set of lungs so that when you inhale and you exhale and your vocal cords vibrate, amen, there's a sound that goes forth that cannot, must not be canceled. Are you with me? Social media cannot be your voice. God's given you a voice. Use your voice. Be dependent on your voice. Be dependent. Make sure God has given you a sphere of influence of people that you communicate with. Come on now. I want to challenge the church of today because if they, if you grow dependent on a system, that system will control you eventually, but they cannot control what you say. I'm preaching a lot better than some of y'all responding, but that's all right with me. I'm going to preach myself happy. You see, I want to challenge us today to be aware and conscious that the time may come when we have to become more dependent on the Holy Spirit more than ever before. Imagine that, becoming more dependent on the Holy Spirit. The time may come when the Holy Spirit will speak to individuals about a meeting place. I remember speaking with Pastor Claudio 
back before there was social media, before this, this internet thing was on, when the presence of Jesus began to invade his church and his church began to grow and to grow. The time came when word of mouth went forth so fast that there were thousands of people waiting outside of the church. He had to rent a stadium for over 80,000 people. They could not even put advertisement. They didn't have to because the word of mouth propagated and he flew and even an 80,000 person stadium was not big enough to contain the people that were trying to get in. Are you with me? Are you with me? I believe that the time when the Spirit of the Lord, there will be places, there will be regions that the glory of God is going to be so thick, so thick. Amen. People will have visions. They will have dreams. See, we need to begin to operate in the divine system of communication. That communication has not grown old or outdated, but I'm running ahead of myself. You see, I'm talking about the Spirit of the Lord. I'm talking about the angels, the messengers of God. I mean, who needs messenger if we have at our disposal messengers from heaven? Yeah. And messengers bring message. It's not about having an angelic encounter. It's about the angel bringing a message with intentional purpose to change your life and the destiny of those who are attached to you. I'm talking about... The angels of God that according to the Bible, their flames of fire used to help the heirs of salvation. Let me quote to you in the book of Psalms 91. For I will command his angel, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Every believer has angels that are, that are, that, uh, 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 that angels are uh, uh, charged with their care. We, we can see angelic activity throughout scripture. Just got, ask Abraham and Sarah. In Genesis 18, the Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Manri while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and he saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought and then you will wash, may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Here we see how God sent his messengers to give Abraham the news that his wife Sarah would have a son by the same time the following year. Angelic activity is so prevalent throughout the scripture. We see it when God sent his angels to rescue Lot and his family from Sodom and Gomorrah. We see the angel of the Lord who appeared to Joshua when he was at the outskirts of Jericho. This is when Joshua approached this angel wielding a sword and asked him whose side was he on. We know the rest of the story, don't we? We also see that an angel appeared to Elkanah, who, the one who was to become the father of Samuel the prophet. In the New Testament, we find the angel of the Lord who appeared to Zechariah, the, who, the one who was to become the father of John the Baptist. He appeared to him when he was already in an old age, and his wife and his wife was barren. But when the angel appeared at the right hand of the altar of incense, everything changed. See, there is a time when the messengers from heaven are going to be released, when we don't have to look to social media for news, but the Spirit of the Lord will speak to our hearts and tell us where we're supposed to be I believe those I've lived like that amen praise God when the Holy Ghost says you need to be at this place at this time and at this hours and other believers who are tuned in into the frequency of heaven will hear the same thing how do you think the persecuted church operates anyhow they cannot even communicate oh but they have, see, the authorities have encountered a, a means of communication that cannot be tracked by flesh and blood. Hallelujah! We also see the angel of the Lord appearing to Peter while he was sleeping. Well, he was bound in chains between two soldiers because they were gonna, he was going to be killed the next day. Then there are dreams and visions, of course. Let us not forget that visions and dreams are the language of the Spirit. Joseph uh, was instructed in a dream to escape to Egypt with Mary and baby Jesus. See, the church of Jesus Christ must be nimble. We have to 
We've got to be flexible and not tied down so much to the systems of this world. Remember that we belong to a kingdom that has no end. And the kingdom of God has a unique, a unique communication system that cannot be altered, messed with, or fooled with. What is the key? What is the password? Total submission to the will of God being washed in the blood. How many say yes and amen? We are subjects of a king who's coming back riding on a white horse. The heavenly communication system has been time tested. This system has no glitches. They will always work with incredible precision. They never go down. They never need to be updated. The system is far superior to the systems of this world. They are hack proof. No one can break into them. Your data is securely stored. Guess what? In the original cloud. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Isn't that interesting? They come up with a cloud to store information. It's just a hack. Y'all, it's just a hack. It's just a copycat. Come on now. Are you with me? You just show me what I need to do. See, you need to get in your prayer closet. When you get in your prayer closet, Jesus, show me. Show me what I'm... You, you, you need to get familiar with how to use the system of the Holy... Let me tell you, the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. See, I, I, I remember the time years ago I was sitting in the back of a church. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. You need to be in Orlando this January, I think it was the 19th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, told my wife, says, are you sure this guy? I said, well, what do we got to lose but a couple of plane tickets? That's okay. Sure enough, the plane had been delayed. We're supposed to land about 6 p.m., but we were walking in Atlanta. There was a, a flight that said to Orlando, we said, can we get in? He said, sure, come on in. At 3 o'clock, exactly, the plane touched down. God's communication system is flawless. It's absolutely flawless. Amen. And I want to invite you. I want to challenge you today. No, I'm not, I'm not coming against or prohibiting you or saying that you shouldn't use. But I want to offer you a much superior alternative. Are you with me? Because there is no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm not saying that using uh, uh, the social media is bad. or it's a, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm challenging you, the day is coming when the people of God are going to have to use more of the Holy Spirit. They're going to have to get in their prayer closet to hear the directions and the instructions from God. And it will bypass whatever is trying to bring the vision, whatever is, because, it, 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 you know, the, the thing that stands between the agenda of the Antichrist and of this world is the church. It's the church. The church is hated. But you know what? They hated Jesus too. So we're in good company. How many say yes and amen? See, I'm not trying to be popular. I'm trying to be like Jesus. I'm not going around like a bull in a china shop doing things to be disliked or to be hit. No, no, no. I Just be like Jesus. Just be like Jesus. That's all you need to be. And the rest, good and bad, will come. The bad will come from the world, but the good will come from heaven. How many say yes and amen? Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but trust in me, I have overcome the world. But going back to the original scripture, that was just a side note. In Mark chapter 2, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They heard that he had come home. The people heard that Jesus had come home. They heard that Jesus was in the house. Oh, my God, I sense that the day is coming, just like in Capernaum, that people will hear that Jesus is in the house. Yes, they will hear that Jesus is in Trinity Christian Center. They will hear that we're not just simply talking about him and entertaining people with just stories. I don't, I don't need a smoke machine. I do not want a smoke machine. Not that there's anything sinful with using one if you want to, but I'd much rather have the real deal, Shekinah glory, land in this house. Hallelujah. Come on now. The time will come when the presence of the Almighty God is going to show up and it's going to stay. 
because God desires not just a place of visitation, but a place of habitation. I'm not simply talking about a good long service. No, I'm talking about the real deal Shekinah glory. I'm talking about the Kabbalah of God landing on this house. When the glory comes, there is no room for playing games. It is no longer time for business as usual. It will be a time of great repentance and realignment of our individual and corporate priorities. How many say yes and amen? The evidence that Jesus is in the house is not because of advertisement on YouTube or social media. There will be a massive word of mouth campaign and miracles that will attract the multitudes. How many say yes and amen? The Spirit of the living God will draw people from far and near. Many will see this house in dreams and search for it, even different regions of the world. How many say yes and amen? You want me to prove it to you? I went to, to a funeral of a well-known man of God a few years ago. And one of his the, uh, the deceased armor bearers, you know, that you know, this man was an incredible leader in, in the move of God. And, and uh, he told this pastor that I know when he saw me, he says, that's the man I saw in my dream. That's the man I saw in my dream. That's the man I saw in my dream. And he says so much, the pastor, come over, pastor. Pastor David, this, this man says he saw you in his dream. He says he's never seen you in real, but he saw you and he wants to meet you. I said, yes. I said, what was the dream? <laughs> dream spoke about destiny. Spoke about destiny. He spoke about a move of God. Amen. People will never will run to you that have never heard or seen you because of the glory of the Lord, because of the presence of God. Many will see this house in their dreams. Because Jesus is in the house, there will be standing room only services. Say with me, standing room only. God has already spoken it to us prophetically. They are coming from the north, south, east, and west. It is a done deal. It's about to happen. Today we're a day closer to the fulfillment of the word of the Lord. When Jesus is in the house, everything changes. Our agendas get changed. We're taken up by his glory and his splendor. There are numerous scriptures that mention about Jesus being in the house. See, when Jesus was in the house, Mary wipes Jesus' feet with her hair. In John chapter 12, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived when Lazarus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of, of pure nard an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. See, the setting was the house uh, of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. This was the, Jesus' favorite house in Bethany. It was when he was in the house that Mary poured an expensive perfume on his feet and wiped his feet with her hair. The take-home lesson here being that Mary worshipped the master with the best that she had. See, true worship will cost you something. It will cost you something. It will cost you your, your flesh. It will cost your pride. It will cost you time. But when you, you break your heart, you, you break your, your, your alabaster box, when you break it before the Lord, there is an aroma and in, uh, just uh, this fragrance that will fill the air. Her worship was costly, but the master was worth it. And then some... When you worship him and you pour out your best, it may smell good to others, but it's not for them. It's only for him. Come on now. When, when we get here and we begin to worship, it's not just when the music is right. When you pour out your heart, you break your heart before him and you worship him. Because worship is cost something. It, there is a price to be paid. You got to go past emotions. You got to go past your flesh. And you said, Jesus, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to worship you when I don't feel like that. The Word of God speaks about the sacrifice of, pay, of praise, which is the fruit of your lips. Sacrifice is because it's costly. Sacrifice, you know, it, it, a sacrifice is a sacrifice. It's not pleasant at times. Oh, my God. When Jesus is in the house, this house will be filled with the perfume of the rose of Sharon. Have you ever, have you ever smelled the rose of Sharon? I have. 
several services i i've smelled the perfume of heaven i'm going what is that incredible fragrance i've never smelled that you know pastor clay and myself i think alan were there and jimmy and we had another experience in another place my god see when jesus is in the house he healed he healed the mother-in-law peter's mother-in-law to be specific in luke chapter 4 jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. And they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over, over her and rebuked the fever. And he left her. She got up at once and began to wait on him. See when Jesus is in the house. Healings will be commonplace. No illness can stand in the presence of the almighty God. The Bible says in Isaiah 53. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we consider him punished by God. Stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds were healed. When Jesus is in the house, healing is in the house. When Jesus is in the house, the dead come to life. When Jesus is in the house, the dead come to life. See, the story of Jairus' daughter comes to mind in Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died. But come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him. And so did his disciples. Just, when, just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter. He said, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away. The girl is not yet, is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. The news of this spread throughout all that region. Say the news spread without the use of social media, without the use of mass means of communications. There were no telephone. What was the me my communication was? This. Say with me, word of mouth. And they had overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. The word that God has given you is powerful, it's effective, it's, it can communicate things in the spirit. You, the mouth that God has given you can not only, not only spread the news about Jesus, but speak life to death situations. See... When the synagogue leader's daughter was, had died, the scriptures did not tell us her age or the cause of death, but the synagogue leader understood that although he had all the religious rules and regulations down, pat, nothing, none of these things could raise up his dead daughter. But he had heard and perhaps seen the miracles that Jesus performed. He made sure to inquire where Jesus was, and then he went, found him, and fell at his feet, begging him to come to his house to lay his hands on his daughter we know about the delay that happened once Jesus agreed to go with him. The woman with the issue of blood showed up and placed a demand on the anointing of Jesus. All she did was to touch the edge of his garment. Her chronic bleeding stopped immediately. Finally, Jesus made it to the house. When Jesus stepped into the house, it was full of noisy people. See, when Jesus is in the house, truly in the house, the spectators, those who want a dog and pony show will be run out. Come on now. Those who want to just gawk, just who want to gawk and criticize the very presence that will attract the sinners, will drive out the gawkers and the ones who are enemies of the cross who come in to criticize. When Jesus is in the house, then resurrection is in the house. The spirit of death cannot stay in the same place that the author of life occupies. When Jesus is in the house, he turns doubters into believers. We find that after the burial and resurrection of our Lord, that all the disciples were in the house. We find this in John chapter 20. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told them, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where his nails were and put my hand onto his side, I will not believe a week later. His disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. 
reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told them, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. There are many who struggle with doubt. Thomas was one who was not wanting to have unbelief. Thomas just wanted to have a personal experience with the risen Savior. A week later, Jesus showed up and told him exactly what he had told the other disciples. And so he got to put his finger into the wound in his hand and got to put his whole hand into Jesus' side. And then he, he, he just said, my Lord and my God. See, Thomas was so, was, did so and he was amazed. Jesus told him to stop doubting. When Jesus is in the house, doubters, doubters become ardent believers because the evidence of his presence is all around and it is undeniable. See, a miracle settles the argument. When Jesus is in the house, the blind get healed. We see Matthew chapter 9 as Jesus went on from there. Two blind men followed him calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him and he asked them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them sternly, see that no one knows about this. But they went on and spread the news about him all over the region. Heavenly means of communication. The word is near you. It is in your mouth. Amen. Praise God. So we know that the setting of this miracle was in Capernaum in the house of Peter. Jesus was traveling. The two men follow, blind men followed him crying out to have mercy on them. When he had gone indoors, Jesus was in the house. The men followed him and Jesus asked them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Their reply was unequivocal. Yes, Lord. Jesus touched them and their, and their sight was restored. When Jesus is in the house, blind eyes are open. It's not just the physically blind, but also those who are spiritually and emotionally blind. Today, like always, there are those who suffer from a lack of physical sight. This is a result of sickness, genetics, or acquired blindness. But there's also a multitude of people who are blind spiritually. They walk in a dark world of hopelessness and despair when Jesus is in the house. All forms of blindness from any ideology is healed. Now, when Jesus is in the house... Is the place where the word of God gets preached. Say with me, the word gets preached. See, you cannot have Jesus in the house and not have his word take precedence. We must have the word of God. See, our faith is not founded on emotion. Our faith is founded on the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Are you with me, church? Are you still with me? Are you tracking with me this morning? When Jesus is in the house, the word of God is preached. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus went through Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaimed the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. It's important to know that Jesus, when Jesus is in the house, there is the preaching and teaching of the word. Jesus honors his word. The word of God is the love letter to mankind. It is God's instruction manual for our lives. Psalms 119, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous law. When Jesus is in the house, he will confirm his words with signs, wonders, and miracles. When Jesus is in the house, the captives get set free. The captives get set free. How many say yes and amen? Luke chapter 13 on the Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leaders said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites, doesn't, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it to out to give it water, then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan had kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what has bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. See, Jesus was in the synagogue. He was in God's house. He was teaching there. There was a woman who was bent over for 18 years. The cause of her being crippled was not physical, but it was a spirit. 
Now, I want to take just a few moments to say that demonic oppression or possession can have physical manifestations. Imagine this woman when 18 years earlier was bent over by a spirit. It must have been extremely painful and uncomfortable. The evil spirit did that, but as time passed by, all of her muscles and joints froze in place. So now the damage from being bent over was irreversible in the natural. It's called a contracture to those of us who are in medicine, right? So when Jesus saw her, he called her forward. He spoke to her and told her she was set free from her infirmity. Then he laid his hands on her and she immediately straightened. The spirit that had hurt her cap, hurt, held her captive and had distorted her body left immediately. And she straightened up on the spot. When Jesus is in the house, he will confront religious spirits. When Jesus is in the house, he will confront religious spirits. In the same story of the crippled woman, the synagogue leader was indignant and said to the people that there are six days for work, so come and be healed in those days, the synagogue leader. Instead of giving God the glory for the deliverance of this poor woman, went on to criticize Jesus. I guess the synagogue leader felt upstaged by Jesus. But Jesus answered, you hypocrites, does then each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stone lead it to water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had kept bound for 18 years, long years, be set free on the Sabbath day for what bound her? When Jesus is in the house, his goal is for all to come to the saving knowledge of Christ. He died for all. Salvation and deliverance is for all. Jesus died even for the religious the problem with the religion is that they think they have an in with God. They want to control the gate to salvation. See, the synagogue leader took the miracle that Jesus did and said, well, well but, but there are the six days in which she could be healed. Who cares what the day is? She's free. She's healed. See, can we allow our theology to keep us from setting the captives free? Are you kidding me? John chapter 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. The religious are not the way. Jesus is the way. My job as your pastor is to point you to Jesus. Follow him and obey him. If you want to see pastor happy, obey Jesus. You want to see pastor happy, obey Jesus. Notice that it was not the sinners who crucified Christ. It was the religious when Jesus is in the house, the call for salvation and deliverance is for those who think that they have it all together as well. No wonder the Bible says in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourself to your elders. All, all of you clothe yourself with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. The, religi the religious spirit is a spirit of pride and arrogance. It's all about big I and little you. I have so many times dealt with individuals who feel superior to me and treat me as such. But who cares? That's their problem to deal with. It ain't got nothing to do with me. Are you with me? Because I ain't trying to prove to anybody what I am or who I am in Christ Jesus. If they don't want to acknowledge that is their problem, that's for them. They want to feel superior. Go for it. I'll help put out a red carpet before you. I'll, I'll wave flags before you. If it makes you feel important, if it makes your boat float, I'll go for it. But I know in whom I have believed. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. Hallelujah! I pray for those individuals that so their eyes of their understanding will be enlightened. Yes, Jesus died for the souls of Tarsus and for the unlovable. Yes, he died for his enemies. Yes, he died for the religious too. The Bible says in Romans 5, for if, if while we were yet God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? When Jesus is in the house, he institutes the Lord's Supper. Say with me, communion. In John chapter 13, he was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. 
and that he had come from God and was returning to God. And <coughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord what I also pass unto you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed to bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. See, when Jesus is in the house, we participate of communion. When Jesus is in the house, he institutes his, the Lord's Supper. It is remembering the reason for our great salvation. The Lord's Supper was instituted by Christ himself. It is a way of us being reminded of the great sacrifice. Our salvation is free, but it is not cheap. Salvation is free, but it is not cheap. It's extremely pricey. It, it, it cannot be bought. It cannot be bought, right? What shall a man give is if he gains the whole world yet loses his soul? What recompense shall she give for it? To celebrate the Lord's Supper is to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. See, in a day and era where folks are easily triggered and offended by death, or by something that does not appear, you know, amenable to their senses and their sense of propriety. The cross, the sacrifice, the blood stands in direct opposition to these whitewash proper things. As you see, the blood of the, of the lamb and the body of our Lord causes the snowflakes to melt. Come on now, somebody with me in this house. Praise God. We must always keep in mind the blood of his, and his wounded body. We cannot deviate from the commandments of our Lord. We need to do what he said to do. If we don't, then we can easily be led off course and end up deviating from sound doctrine. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Jesus, when Jesus is in the house, Jesus actually desires to be in the house. And let me come to you out of the book of Revelation chapter 3. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus desires to come into your house. A house without Jesus is not a home. A house without Jesus is not a home. Make Jesus the, the center of your home life. Teach the word, but most importantly, live the word. A few weeks ago, as we were about to eat lunch, or I think it was supper, I don't remember, my family and my, my, one of my granddaughters saw me take a bite without saying a prayer out loud. Sometimes when I'm in a hurry, I pray in my mind. But this granddaughter of mine threw me under the bus. She told her mama that Abu did not pray. And she said, and Abu is a preacher. <laughs> oh, my God. We're speaking to, see, we're constantly speaking to others with our actions or lack thereof. Let us make sure that Christ is at the center of our homes. Let us make sure that there is prayer in our homes. Let us invite Jesus in. Jesus can go through the door, but if he wants to, but he instead chooses to stay outside of the door. He knocks at the door and waits patiently for our response. Although he can barge in, he will not do that. He will not violate our, our self, our, our ability to have self-determination, to take our, make our own decisions and have our own free will. It's not just the door of our homes. The first and most important door that he knocks at is the door of our hearts. It's time to invite Jesus into our hearts. Let us open up the doors of our hearts. The way to open the doors of our hearts is to surrender to him again. The way to open the door of our hearts is to read his word and to obey it. And lastly, Jesus wants to fill this house with glory. Jesus wants to fill this house with glory. 
And I quote you in the book of Haggai, chapter 2, verse 6. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea, and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The context of this scripture is that the temple of Jerusalem was, had been rebuilt. There were, there were those of the people of Israel who were older and remember the temple of Solomon and all of his glory. But that temple had been destroyed. It was long gone and there was a new temple that had been revealed. See, they regarded the present temple like it was nothing. But the prophetic word was that that, that generation was not for, was for that generation not to be dismayed, to be strong, to take courage. God promised that he would shake the heavens and the earth, the seas and the dry land. God said, I will shake the nations and the desire of all nations will come and I will fill this house with glory. What they did not realize was that that very temple that had been rebuilt was the very structure in which Jesus, the son of God, was going to step in in his human form. That was the structure. See, it lacked a lot of the outside pretty things. It lacked a lot of the gold and the precious stones. But why would there be a need for gold and precious stones if, the, if, the, if, if Jesus himself, the one who, can, who does not have a price, the treasure of God himself was going to walk there. He was going to be the adornment of that structure. Are you with me, church? This is the deal with Trinity Christian Center. We're about to celebrate in a few short years the 100th anniversary of the foundations of the church. There are some who remember what was. They remember the move of God of yesteryear and believe in their hearts that those glorious times will never be again. But I have a word from God for y'all. God will again shake the heavens and the earth. God will shake the evil, this evil and perverse generation. God will shake the foundations of woke ideology and gender confusion. God will set his enemies to flee in confusion. God will shake the religion to its core. God will shake the lives of those who are spiritually dead and asleep. There is a shaking coming. This shaking is to, is to dislodge with that which is not real. This shaking will dislodge and bring down anything that is not founded on the rock which is Christ. This Shaking is coming to do away with what was to establish that which is the word and Christ centered. In order to bring order, there has to be sometimes a temporary state of disorder. That's what the shaking is all about, to shake off, to remove what has been established that is not founded on the word of God. We cannot afford not to have Jesus in this house. We cannot afford to play a religious game. We cannot afford to please the congregants at the expense of pleasing Jesus. Are you still with me, church? I know I'm preaching a lot better than you are responding, but that's all right with me. I'm going to preach myself happy. I'd rather God be happy with, with us. I'd rather God be happy than us be happy. Any day, any time, hands down, if we please him, then we will be not happy, but blessed. I'd rather be blessed than happy any day. The Bible says in Isaiah 1, if you're willing and obedient, you will eat of the good things of the land. When Jesus in the, is in the house, there will be unity like never before. Say with me, unity. Not uniformity. We don't have to have uniformity in order to have unity. We can have the best unity in the midst of our greatest diversity. Psalm 133. 133. How good and pleasant it is when people, God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down Aaron's beard, down the color of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessings, even life forevermore. When Jesus is in the house, we will love one another. We will love one another. It's not just liking one another, but loving one another. Loving each other enough to tell the truth. Amen. Speaking the truth in love, by the way. The truth in love. We cannot use truth or facts to hurt others. Are you with me, church? John 13, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. If you love one another, 
when Jesus fills the house, we will forgive each other. Ephesians chapter 4, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forget Christ, God forgave you. Jesus fills this house. There will be salvations. Say with me, salvations. One of the hallmarks that Jesus is in the house is that we refuse to become a bless me club. Are you listening? I'm not, I don't come here to have spiritual jollies. I come here to get equipped so I can win souls. I come here to get full of the glory of the power of God so that I could be an effective witness in the world. Are you with me? The focus will not be on ourselves, but on Christ and on souls. Say with me, Christ and souls. What is this? This is a training. This is an equipping center. This is a healing center. Jesus blesses us and equips us so that we can be his hands, his feet, and his mouth. Amen. And you will preach. This gospel will be preached. Use your words. Use your mouth. See, even with the raising of my granddaughters, they go, wah, wah. use words. I hear my daughter say, use words, use words. See, when we go to prayer, oh, God, wah, wah. God say, use words. I gave you a mouth. Bring your petitions, knowing that I'm hearing you. See, because immaturity inhibits inheritance. Immaturity inhibits inheritance. Can I say that one more time? Immaturity inhibits inheritance. This wasn't even in my notes. That's all right. The focus will be not on ourselves, but on Christ and on souls. Ladies and gentlemen, the heart of God is souls. Let us never forget or neglect the Great Commission. And I quote you in the book of Matthew chapter 24. that Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I want the worship team to come up. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And I'm going to close with this. Out of the book of Haggai, chapter 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Can we stand up to our feet? In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. For those who want their earthly stability and predictability... <laughs> You're looking at the wrong place. Because if you expect to have stability and predictability here on earth, let me tell you, let me bust your bubble. The shaking is coming. Shaking is coming. But see, my stability and my hope and my stability is not here on earth. I have a home in glory. My citizenship is not on this earth. And my allegiance is not to a political party. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. Come on, say it with me. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. I will not excuse some politicians' lack of godliness or compromise the principles of the word. Listen, I just teach you the word, vote according to what the word says. That's all I'm going to say about that. But listen, I pledge allegiance to the Lamb because He's coming back riding a white horse. And the political systems of this world will come to naught. They're going down, baby, they're going down, down to Chinatown. Let me tell you something. I will shake all nations. And what is desired by all nations will come. <laughs> and I will fill this house with glory. I will fill this house with glory. I'm going to fill this house with glory. 
the prerequisite for filling the house with glory is the shaking. Yeah. The prerequisite of the house being filled with glory is the shaking. Let my life be shaken. Let everything that may be attached to my life that is not of God be shaken off. In the shaking, I'm going to be uncomfortable. In this world, you will have affliction, but trust in me, I have overcome the world. Again, we're not looking for a, a church that makes us comfortable. I'm looking for a house of God. It's His house. He's supposed to be comfortable, not me. When I come into His house, I come with reverence. And my flesh gets challenged and uncomfortable. Well, the pastor didn't have to go there. See, I'm not here to make you feel comfortable on your way to hell. I'm here to declare what Jesus says about you. He loves you the way you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay the way that you are. When Jesus is in the house, one of the hallmarks of a move of God is massive repentance. Ladies and gentlemen, I have experienced it. Mama, remember back in 99, 1999, we went to the Awake America that came from Brownsville to Monroe. Was it Monroe? We had been that night. We stayed in that hotel. And the next morning at 8 o'clock sharp, I opened up my eyes and the spirit of repentance hit me. He now began to cry and to cry and to repent and repent and repent. One hour, and Miss Yvonne said, David, can you pray a little low, softly because people are going to think I'm doing something to you in this room. And I'm going, okay. Wah! I repent, Lord. Because when Jesus is in the house, we, all we can say is, woe is me. For my eyes have seen the king. We're going to have an Isaiah kind of experience the year the king Uzziah died. I saw the Lord, he's high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. And I said, woe is me for I'm a man of unclean lips. See, a true mark of a move of God is when our flesh has trouble being comfortable in his presence. Because it ain't about making your flesh feel good about yourself. It's about your spirit being made right with God. Let's close our eyes. How many want, how many want Jesus in the house? See, when Jesus is in the house, I don't care if they watch my YouTube sermons or not. That's not going to bring them in. Trust me, that's not the thing that's going to bring them in. I guarantee you, it ain't going to be my sermons. It's going to be the presence of the Almighty God. They know they're going to have an encounter with the King. And all we are here is facilitators of an encounter with the King. I'm just one of those ushers in the courts of my king who arranges appointments. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> That's all. Are you willing to be shaken? Are you willing to have your life changed? Are you willing for the routines to be altered so that the, that the law of heaven could happen? See, our lives are about to take a radical change. Sometimes I sit there and I wonder, what will my life look like? Oh, does it really, to me, it doesn't really matter as long as the king shows up. That's all that I want. If he shows up, that's it. That's all that I need. That's all what I want. People think that a move of God is disorder. I have news for you. When the king shows up, there's a heavenly protocol. And he who dares to walk 
unrighteously before the king best be careful I recommend the only way to approach the king is on your face get on your face ask for mercy that's all that I know the times that he has drawn near I thought I really fear for my life not because he was going to kill me I just the closer he got to me I didn't know how to I didn't know how to act all I could do is say Lord if it's not for the blood of Jesus thank God that my righteousness is not my own my righteousness is of the Lord my 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 good acts or righteousness is as filthy rags before him I cast down religion, religiosity, or any work of the flesh because that will not stand before the, our God. But my, the Word of God says that a humble and a contrite heart you will not deny. Are we ready to host Jesus? Are we ready to host Him in our homes, in our marriages, in our families? In above all corporately I want us all to come to the front right now can we send them an invitation right now come on let's give them an invitation to come let's give them an invitation come on Lord, let this be one of those places. Let this be one of those places because this is not the only place. Thank God. Thank God this is not the only place where the, the glory of God is going to fill and it's going to land. This is one of many places. Thank God for that. Can you imagine the responsibility of being? See, I hear people who have walking in spiritual arrogance saying, well, we got what others don't have. And we listen, I'm sorry, but no. The king will get what he paid for. It's not just one region. It's from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. We cast down every main imagination that will rise up against the knowledge of God. We cast down arrogance. We categorically reject it. And King Jesus, we surrender to you today. Lord, fill my house. Put your hand on your heart and say, Lord, fill this house. Come in, Jesus. I open up the door to you. Fill my house. Fill my home, Lord. Lord, fill this place, Jesus. We give you an invitation, Lord. You don't even have to stand at the door before you even knock. We open the doors wide. Open up, you heavenly doors. Open up wide, you heavenly gates. For the King of glory is coming in. He's going to come in. In Jesus' name. Father, today, we lumber ourselves. Let's get on our knees right now. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, let this house be one of those places where you are made comfortable. Jesus, let this, let this house be a house not just of visitation, but of permanent habitation. Lord God, whatever modifications you want, However you want it to be, it's about you, not about us. And it's about souls. In Jesus' name, we pray.